There we go. So the recorder is started. Um, what we're going to talk about today is more stack related topic. In fact, I would say every single class from here on is going to have something to do with the stack. Okay, so I'm hoping that most of you have had a chance to review the material from last Thursday, particularly the trays um, that uh, one of your classmates has already you know, made a copy of and the link is from the Discord server. So that is a very important resource, okay? You know, because <clears throat> it's harder to kind of write about it in words than to demonstrate everything using a trace, you know, which includes you know, how instructions execute, what memory locations are accessed, and so on. Okay, so that's a very useful resource. So today's class is gonna start with <clears throat> lawyer talk. Because the lawyer talk has to do with you know, the mutual agreement between the caller, you know, the code that is performing the call, and the call lead, which is the subroutine or the function that is being called. We are not going to be able to cover every single point here, okay? But we are going to cover a few points that are super important. The first thing is for me to go over the points that we have already covered, okay? So I'm going to highlight you know, the things that we have already covered which is the return address, the address of the instruction right after the JMP to the callee, is pushed by the caller onto the stack before the unconditional branch to the function that we are calling. So this one we have already talked about, this one we have already talked about in the previous class on last Thursday. <clears throat> So if you have not had a chance to review the code that we talked about or the lab that you did on Thursday, um, it's gonna be a little bit difficult today because you know, what we're gonna do today is built on top of what we talked about on last Thursday. So this is how things look from the caller's perspective. And then from the call lead's perspective, what we did last week is, has to do with this part here the stack pointer points to the return address. So that is what something that we did last week. And then also at the exit point of the callee, we also know that the callee is responsible to pop the return address and then use that return address to return to the code of the caller so that the caller can continue its execution. So what I have done so far, the, what I have highlighted up, up to this point are the things that we have already talked about. It's just that I never I did not refer to this document when we talked about it. Yes. Uh, yes, that is correct. So we are going to have a main function, you know, just like in C and C++, just so that this way, you know, we are looking at assembly language programming from the context of something that you're familiar with, which is in C++ or C programming, there's always a main function. The main function acts as the entry point of the entire program. So in this case, I'm replicating that even though I don't have to, but I'm replicating the, the fact that we are using main as an entry point you know, for the entire program. All right, so let me highlight what we're gonna be focusing on today. What we'll be focusing on today is how do we set up how do we pass parameters? So the way we pass parameters, um, okay, so there are two terms, related terms, but they're not exactly the same. From the caller's perspective, they are called arguments, okay? So everything that you put you know, into the parentheses you know, after when you're calling a function, those are called arguments from the perspective of the caller. So highlighted right here, it says your arguments are pushed in reversed order, which means the last argument is pushed first, okay? So we are not talking about the ordering of the arguments on the stack. We are talking about the ordering of when it is pushed, okay? So it is pushed first. Last argument is pushed first. On TTP, arguments are pushed contiguously, no gap between the arguments. I have to make this point because in other compilers, there may be gaps between arguments for the purposes of optimizing memory access. So that way, you know, you don't have to um, waste memory cycles um, when you're accessing a multi-byte thing, you know, that is an argument. But in TTP, they are contiguous. They're one after another. 
This implies the last argument has the highest address because it's pushed first. So that whole statement, okay, the third statement, has to do with do you remember how things are pushed on the stack? What do we do with the stack pointer? And then what do we do with what the stack pointer points to? So you got to remember that. Okay, there's nothing I can do to help you remember that unless you kind of review the material, you know, and you kind of practice a little bit. So that's from the caller's perspective of how the arguments are set up. When the subroutine or when the function returns, then the caller has something else to do. Um, if there are arguments, okay, so let me highlight that portion that is applicable. So if there are, in fact, arguments, the arguments will still be sitting on the stack. So the caller is responsible to, quote, unquote, you know, clean up the stack. In other words, the arguments that are still sitting on the stack at this point of the execution, they are useless at this point. So the, the caller is responsible to deallocate these items from the stack. Now, deallocating is not the same thing as a pop, because a pop means, you know, oh, this value on the stack is of importance to me. I want to store that to something so I can use it later. That's popping. To deallocate simply means, oh, this is useless. I'm just going to get rid of it. Okay, so there's a difference between deallocating, which means I just don't need these items to be on the stack anymore, versus popping something from the stack, which basically means I need to retrieve that item from the stack because it is, I'm, I'm going to need it right now to use it for something. Yes, go ahead. Both increment the stack pointer. Yes. So they both involve incrementing the stack pointer. The only difference is, do you need to copy that content in RAM to something else first? So when you pop, you do. But when you deallocate, you simply increment the stack pointer. So we are just changing. We're moving the bolt mark to indicate which part of the stack is still quote unquote in use. All right. Any other questions about the caller's perspective? How do we push arguments on the stack? And how do we clean up arguments on the stack? So I'll show you guys sample programs you know, to illustrate all of these points. Today, we'll also talk about one little thing. Um, the return value is always going to be in register A. So if the callee has a return value, then the return value is always going to be in register A. OK, that's a fairly simple thing. I'll illustrate that as well. Yes. A, so a scalar is basically everything other than an array or a structure. So a float is a scalar, a pointer is a scalar, an integer is a scalar, a char is a scalar, and so on. So anything that's, I, I guess you can say anything that is not a composite. Because a structure is a composite, which means it has components that are inside and you can extract those individual components. An array is also a composite because you have individual elements inside and you can get to those by indexing into the array. All right, so now we switch to the callee perspective. So when, when we are looking at this from the callee pers callee's perspective, what we see as arguments are now called parameters. So if there are parameters, the first parameter is going to start at the address immediately after, quote unquote, higher than, that of the return address. That simply has to do with the ordering of when it is pushed. So this is why it is super important for you guys to have already understood and you know, be familiarized with how things are pushed on the stack and how things are popped from the stack. The last argument has the highest address, and parameters are contiguous in TTP, which is something that, something that we talked about already. Um, we are not going to talk about local variables, so we are not going to be getting into that today. But there's one more point that is super important. The values of the value of registers A, B, and C are not assumed to be preserved by the callee. So the function that you call has the freedom to change any or all of these registers. So do not assume the registers are going to be preserved. <clears throat> And on the flip side, in the callee's code, 
there is also no need to preserve the values of registers A, B, or C. So the callee can just assume that, oh, I have all, these of, all three of these registers to play with. Register D is not part of this because register D is our stack pointer. The stack pointer is the one thing that helps to connect the caller and the function that the caller is calling. So are, we, are there any questions about what is discussed in this particular slide? I know it sounds a little abstract, but we'll, I will illustrate all of these with a program. Yes, go ahead. Um, the return address is always pushed. So which point are you looking at? Yes, so this if any applies to the arguments. The return address is always pushed, but you know, um, after all the arguments, if any. So if you have arguments, then you push all the arguments first. Last argument first. The last argument is pushed first, and then you push all the remaining arguments. Then you push the return address. And then you do the immediate jump to the function. And that's why by the time you get to the function, the return address is always what the stack pointer points to. All right, so what we'll do now is we're going to take a look at you know, a very simple C program, and then we'll translate that C program into assembly code, observing these agreements between the caller and the callee, and then we'll be running traces along the way as well. So that means, you know, if you want to, you can also, you know, get to the assembler, and at whatever time you want, you can take a snapshot by making a copy of the assembler at the time, then you, will be, then you would have captured both the assembly code as well as the trace. And I think that can be useful for studying. Um, I know there are you know, very responsible people on the Discord server who would do this, but I would say one thing, don't depend on other people when you can do it, okay? So uh, that's just my philosophy, okay? You know, it, it doesn't mean that you have to do things that way, but you know, personally, if I can do it myself, I would do it myself and not to have to rely on somebody else to remember to have to do that. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some you know, C programs. And these particular C programs are, I just you know, write these code, you know, this, these programs on the fly. So that means you know, they can vary from one semester to another semester. Can people all the way to the back of the classroom read the text clearly or do, you, do we need a slightly bigger font? It's all good? Okay, all right. And because this is recorded, it means that you know, if you're kind of fuzzy about a few lines, you, know, you can always you know, get to the recording. And I think the recording is usually pretty clear. You, know, you can just kind of freeze the frame and really read you know, the text. All right, so let's go ahead and start with a program you know, in C and then another program written in assembly. I typically have one particular you know, program in mind that is actually kind of helpful you know, in this process. So we'll start with, um, I'm gonna use the same program. So that means you know, it's, it's, it's important for you guys to take snapshots of the assembler at the right time. Okay. So I'm gonna say this is just add.c, it is a regular C program. And on the other side we have add.ttpasm, which is the assembly code, and I would do both in horizontal split. Nope, okay, that's not horizontal. <clears throat> so if, if little o is not horizontal, then it has to be a big O, because one is vertical split, the other one is horizontal. All right, so I'm gonna write the C code first. The C code is gonna have, you know, pound include stdint.h. By the way, what is that? What is stdint.h? Standard integer, very good, okay. I'm so glad that some people are paying attention. Um, when, I mean, I know most of you, when you're taking other classes, you don't use the you know, standard integer.h because you don't really need to know the range of an integer. You know, you hardly have any programs that would get to the limit of a 32-bit, you know, let alone a 64-bit integer. 
But when you are out there to write commercial programs, you should know the range of the values that you need to store in an integer. And as a result, you should always specify the width of the integer to make sure that the integer is wide enough to store the range of values intended for that variable, okay? All right, so now we're gonna write a, a particular program <clears throat> and I'm gonna call this Johnny. And all it does is to return five, okay? You can ask your parents about, you know, what is Johnny, you know, which is a robot, and why five has to do with Johnny. And I know some of you are just Googling right now. It's like, what is Johnny as a robot? Okay, so we'll go ahead and write the assembly code on the other side. So this is the assembly side. I always start with a no op because I intend to run the program when it's all done using uh, River Spider, which is basically using the command line uh, mode of Logisim, and the no op is necessary in that case. LDID zero is not strictly re you know, needed because all registers are reset to zero to begin with, but this is, I emphasize that we are initializing the stack corner in this case. JMPI to main, because you know, the entry point is main. We're gonna change the way you know, this is done at some point, but I'm not too concerned at this point, so we have a halt here. The main idea is, how about Johnny? How do we write Johnny as a function? So can, does, does anyone remember how do I return a scalar? An integer is certainly a scalar. Yes, but what is the agreement? You, you, you got it, you, you nailed the answer. But I was asking kind of the prerequisite question of what is the agreement between the caller and the callee when it comes to return values, scalar return values. It's in register A, very good. Okay, so if the return value is just a simply, you know, simply a constant of five, oh, okay, we can do that pretty easily, just like that. Okay, so now I need to return. So at this point, the return address is what the stack pointer is pointing to. So to retrieve that means I just need a pop operation, a stack pop operation. So we already talked about what a pop operation is. In fact, we have already talked about basic call and return from last Thursday. So I'm just gonna assume that we already know this. So we do a LD. Uh, we cannot use register A anymore because now register A is dedicated to specify the return value, but we can still use register C or register B. I'm going to use C in this case. Increment D. So these two instructions combined is a pop operation. So if you're not sure why these two instructions together is the pop operation, I strongly suggest reviewing the material from last Thursday. And then we have the return value, we have the return address, not the return value, in register C. So a JMPC is going to do the trick to continue execution at the caller. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to do the same thing over here, okay? And then we'll have main like this, and then we just call Johnny. And then we have return zero. That's supposed to be a semicolon, there we go. So the C code is now saved, the assembly code is now saved. Yes, go ahead. So the register is the stack Yep, register D is the stack pointer. So why is it? Um, because it is supposed to be initialized to the location after the end of RAM, all the RAM locations. So the end of the RAM locations is location 255. So technically, it should be a 256. But because when you store to a register, which is only 8-bit wide, so everything is congruent modulo 256. So that means 256 is going to be, it's going to be zero because congruent modulo 256 means everything is mod 256. So 256 mod 256 is a zero. All right, so that's the C code. And I will also finish up the assembly code. 
So the assembly code needs to make a call to Johnny. So that means I have to set up you know, the return address. So it, will, it starts with an LDI. I can, at this point, I can choose register A, B, or C. I'm gonna use register A. And I will say Johnny returns here, okay? So I'm not gonna use these you know, super long and ridiculous label name you know, in the near future, but at this point, I'm gonna be using those. Now I need to push it on the stack. So now you have to remember, what is the sequence of instructions to push something on the stack? If you are drawing a blank right now, it's probably okay, because we just introduced that on last Thursday. But hopefully, you guys will start to remember the sequence like really soon, okay? Which means studying, okay? You gotta study, write it in your own notes, okay? The, these two instructions push something on the stack, these two would pop something on the stack and just kind of have it in your notes. Because the moment you write it in your notes, you are already starting to remember, okay? Most of the time, if I write something on a piece of paper you know, as notes, I don't need that anymore. Because the, the, the action of writing it down is actually helping me to remember it. Okay, so we need to push it. So pushing is the reverse of popping. In this case, I have to first decrement D to allocate the one location that I need to store this, and then I store to that location, okay? And then we have a JMPI instruction to Johnny. Like, uh, yep, just like that. And then I need to define Johnny returns here, which is always at the, la the label definition is always you know, right after the JMPI instruction, because there's no way to continue execution at a halt instruction unless you know, there's a jump to this location based on the label. Because a JMPI is an unconditional branch, right? So it always branches. So if it's always branching to Johnny, how do we get to the halt instruction? The only way to get to the halt instruction is another branch instruction. In this case, the other quote unquote branch instruction is the JMPC on line 10. That's the only way for us to get to the halt instruction. Yes? And why not combine line 13 and 15? Because that has to do with the architecture itself not having a pathway for an immediate operand to be stored into the RAM location pointed to by a register. Because if you think about it, what is the I? What is the LDI instruction? Where, is, where do we store the constant that we want to put into the register? the next location, which is in RAM, right? So if I is to have a STI instruction so that you know, I can use it immediately here, then I need to read from RAM and also write to RAM in, at, you know, basically, quote unquote, at the same time. It doesn't have to be at the same time, but I would need to do both a read and a write you know, in the same instruction, which is not impossible but I just want the instruction set to be as risk as possible, so that way, so that way you guys understand you know, exactly how things are done. So, okay, nobody is raising a hand. I'm gonna assume all of you know what risk means. Yes, go ahead. Applause, okay, R-I-S-C. Not K, okay? R I S C stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. R I S C. Now, if you are taking notes, all you have to do is to, you know, write down R I S C. You can Google the rest, okay? What you when, once you Google, you can also find you know, what I just what, what I'm about to tell you. Reduced Instruction Set Computer refers to a philosophy of designing processors so that each instruction would do only the minimum that is needed so that when you combine instructions, you can get everything done. As opposed to CISC or CISC, which is complex instruction set computer. That's the opposite design philosophy, which means you, know, you can have instructions, a single instruction, but it's like calling a subroutine. It does a whole bunch of stuff at the same time. So risk is the way to do things now because Okay, can, can anyone imagine why 
the current industry favors risk architecture and not CISC architecture. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, not exactly, because most most of the time we don't have to debug you know assembly code. The compiler you know typically generates you know the assembly code, and by the time you have the compiler, the compiler typically is well debugged already. So yes, go ahead. Okay, can you repeat that statement? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. Okay, so cross-platform compatibility between manufacturers, in your case, is already achieved. Uh, the current 64-bit instruction set of Intel and AMD processors is actually AMD's instruction set. Intel came up with its own 64-bit instruction set and that was unsuccessful. It was so complex that compilers have problems generating code. And AMD came along and came up with its own 64-bit instruction set. And that's why, you know, when you look at the, uh, the processor um, code for the installation files, the MSI files or the you know, executable and whatnot, the one intended for 64-bit Windows, which is basically all versions of Windows these days, is AMD 64. It's not Intel 64, it is AMD 64. Because AMD actually came up with an improved and much better 64-bit instruction set. So that was not really the main reason. The main reason has to do with energy efficiency. In other words, if you want to get the same amount of uh, computation done, which architecture is better? Most people would think about CISC because it's like, hey, I can specify one opcode and get all of that stuff done. Instead of, oh, one opcode can only get one little, one little simple thing done. But the, the problem with CISC is you are putting a lot of complexity onto the silicon. In other words, the silicon, the die, the processor hardware gets more complex. And this, the risk architecture tends to be a lot simpler so CISC, the RISC architecture has a better um, energy efficiency, which means you know, it takes less energy in joules okay, in order to get the same amount of computation done. Now, that is a major consideration because how much processing power you can fit into a, da a single data center is limited only by heat dissipation cap capacity. In other words, how fast can you cool down a building? That will, that's the limitation. So risk is currently you know, the you know, favored architecture. Um, it's not just the data center that, we, that prefers you know, energy um, efficiency. Um, if you have a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, obviously you want to have energy efficiency. I mean, who wants to have to charge your watch every hour? I certainly don't. Every day is already too much, and the Fitbit can I can charge this every five days, which is still a lot. Okay, if you think about it, this is a watch. Okay, why do I have to charge it every five days? Um, cell phones. Okay, do you want to have to recharge your cell phone every two hours? Probably not, right? So energy efficiency is the reason why we use risk architectures. It's a design philosophy. It's basically, you know, if I can use one single instruction to do, okay, I'll, I'll put it this way. In most CISC architectures, a push is done by one single instruction. A pop is also done by one single instruction. So it's call and so it's return. Those are all single instruction stuff. But when you look at the TTP architecture, you know, how, how many instructions do we need to call? One, two, three, four. We need four instructions to set it up so that we can call a function. In the Intel architecture, it's just call Johnny, done. And you know, when, we need, when we're about to return three instructions, they combine into one single RET or return instruction in the Intel architecture. In other words, um, when you're taking this class using TTP, 
you are looking at the most minimalistic instruction set in order to get things done. Can we call and return? Yes. We just have to use a few more instructions. Yes. It's insanely more. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just more, it is insanely more. Um, the TTP has, I think, 20 something instructions. That's it, right? You know, we have three, we have four to deal with you know, copying something into a register. We got LDI, LD, ST, which is the opposite, and then we have CPR. And then we have uh, six to deal with calculations. We have add, subtract, uh, right shift, not, and or, okay? And then we have compare, which is kind of like a subtract, but not exactly the same. We have increment, we have decrement. We have JMPI. We have all the conditional, you know, J the conditional branches. There are five of those. And then we have the non-I version of the JMPs. So we have JMP with a register, but they all, they're also the conditional versions of JMP. So we have JC, JS, JO, JI, JL, okay? That's it. I can finish that sentence in two minutes. If you are, if you want to look up, you know, the number of instructions for the AMD 64 instruction set, you can do so, okay? So you can ask um, how many instructions are in the AMD 64 instruction set, and it also depends a lot on how you count as well. So counting everything is all wrong, blah, 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 blah. Okay, there we go, so if you count Mnemonics, okay, which is, you know, like LDI is a mnemonic in our case, 1,278 by the AT&T mnemonic, and using the Intel mnemonic, it is a little bit really reduced to 981. I would not want myself to learn that particular assembly language. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so does that kind of help to provide a contrast between a RISC architecture, which is TTP, versus the Intel architecture, which is a CISC? Okay, all right. So let's get back to uh, what we are setting out to do, okay, this particular program. So the C program is actually compilable, okay, and you look at this program, go like, but tech, there's absolutely nothing we can observe out of this program because we don't have any variables to store the return value. So there's nothing we can actually gain from, nothing we can learn from the C program. Well, I, I beg to differ, okay? So I am going to test one of the C program, okay? GCC-G-O, I cannot even remember the, uh, I think it's add dot. C is the source code, okay, GDB add, list the program, okay, not really complicated as a program, it's pretty much as simple as it gets. We'll put a breakpoint on line 11, and then we run the program, and now we stop at line 11. You go like, there's nothing to observe, you know, we did not do a single thing with the return value. Well, as it turns out, GCC, which is also a C compiler, uses about the same standard. In other words, it would also use register A, in quotes, to store the return value. So now I can do an IR um, info register and look at all the registers. See how it has a register called RAX? That's the register A. It has the return value. So even the program in written in C compiled by a modern C compiler shows us that the standard of using a register, typically called register A2, to store the return value, is not just something that I made up. Are we good so far? All right. So this is the behavior of running the C code. So now the next question is, well, what about the running the assembly code? 
So we are going to do that. Uh, we go to, I have to go find my uh, Reaper Spider installation. So now I submit the program in temp is add.ttpasm. Okay. Just takes a while. And this is the magical thing because you know, if you look at the other side, things are actually being done on this side. So it's it's slow, but it's being done. This is the uh, this is the new program. This is the program that we were talking about today, which does not have the call because I forgot to save the file. <laughs> again. All right. So let's go ahead and save the file and do this all over again. So save, okay, and then we switch back to this tab and do it again. But the second time, it should be a lot faster. Or not. All right, so we'll, we'll take a look here, make sure this code is, in fact, the program that I want to run. And then we switch to the analysis tab, which is getting updated right now. All right, so it is done. So by the time the program halts, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> by the time the program halts, there are a few things I need to confirm. I need to make sure the stack pointer is back to zero, zero, which means, quote, unquote, the stack is balanced, okay? Because an unbalanced stack is not a good thing. Two, um, what was the last time I update register A? Well, that is reflected on row 14. A gets a value of 0, 05. That's how I know that I got the right return value. We got all the way to back to main because this halt instruction on line 18 is at location 10 which is the last instruction of the entire program. So this is how I can confirm this program ran as expected. Okay, the C version did exactly the same thing. Are we good so far? Are there any questions about this program? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's uh, okay. First of all, C has no capability of returning an array. So if you attempt to return an array, it will return the address of the array, which is a scalar. If you're returning a structure, it is awfully complicated and inefficient. I can briefly describe the process, but I'm not going to do it in, in, in this class. So what happens is when you return a structure, when you call the function, there is um, a portion of the stack allocated based on the size of the structure that's allocated. So whatever you're returning as a structure is copied into that space on the stack. So that by the time the code returns to the caller, the caller can then go to that portion of the stack to get to the quote unquote return value, which is a structure. But it is awfully inefficient because you end up with a lot of copying around um, so typically, if you need to modify a structure and quote unquote return it, you pass a pointer to the structure to the structure to the callee, so the callee can directly modify the structure. Returning an entire structure is awfully inefficient. If you're doing C++ programming, this also means you're returning an object is also awfully inefficient. The only exception to that rule is when you're returning not an object, but the reference to an object. So we, if you have a class name, and then you have an ampersand, and then a function declaration, then you're returning a reference to an object of the class that you specify, that is more efficient. And that's why you almost never see code that returns a class without a reference. You can do that, but it is just very, very inefficient. <clears throat> All right, so this code works. So we are going to go back to the program and do some modifications. We're going to make it a little bit more fun. So now we use, uh, we declare another function. We'll call this um, Ryan, okay? 
and this has nothing to do with, to do with Professor Hermeles. This Ryan is referring to uh, Jerry Ryan, and Jerry Ryan is going to return seven. So what does Jerry Ryan as an actress have anything to do with the number seven? I will leave it up to you guys to do the Google search. <laughs> yeah, some people are trackies. They understand it's like, yeah, I get it right away. <clears throat> but the rest you know, of you, it's okay not to understand this one. Okay, so now we define your Ryan and do about the same thing. The return value has to be specified in register A. You don't have a choice there because it is an agreement between the caller and the callee. This is how the caller and the callee can, quote unquote, communicate. A return value is one way for the callee to return the value and hence communicate with the caller. But the other part, uh, this time, I don't feel like using register C anymore. I feel like using register B, not a problem. I just have to remember to use, re use register B for the, for the uh, JMP instruction. So now we're gonna do something that is, you know, so are there any questions about how these two programs are basically the same? One is written in C, the other one is written in assembly. Nobody is calling Ryan yet, okay? We just define the function, but it's just sitting here and not being called. Are we good with this one so far? Yes, okay, excellent. So now we're gonna make another function, which is also gonna be like, okay, this is a little bit more interesting. So this one is called sum, and sum is gonna take two parameters. Uh, the first one, eh, let's call that A, and the second one, okay. Syntax highlighting is really helpful because I can tell that I mistyped something. Okay, and all it's gonna return is um, A plus B. That's all it's gonna do. So now I have to go and implement uh, sum as well. All right, so this gets a little bit more complicated because now you have to ask the question, uh, how do we get to parameter A and parameter B? That becomes the question, right? So can anyone remind me where am I going to find those parameters? Yes. They are pushed before the return address. Okay, so whatever argument B is corresponding to is pushed first. Whatever argument is corresponding to parameter A is then pushed second, and then the return address is pushed last before the JMPI instruction, okay? So relative to where the stack pointer points to, where exactly are these things? So I'm gonna use comment here, okay? So in the assembler, you can use slash slash to start commenting, just like you can do that in a regular C program, okay? So I want to find out exactly how the return address, parameter B and parameter A are related in terms of their position. So these, this is completely out of order, okay? So let's just say that what you see as up is higher address and what you see as down as lower address. How should I reorder these three lines so that you know, they are corresponding to the correct ordering in memory space? Remember, register, remember um, parameter B is pushed first, and then we push parameter A, and then we push the return address. Yes. That is correct. So B is at the highest address, A is right below that, and then return address is right below that. Okay? Very good. And can anyone tell me where the stack pointer is pointing to? And I'll give you a clue, it's pointing to one of these three things. Which one do you think it's pointing to? The return address, very good, okay. So this is really helpful because now I can go like, oh, okay. So I can get back to parameter A and parameter B. If I just kinda say, hey, register D, why don't I add one to you? That becomes the address of parameter A. 
If I add two to what register D has, then I get back to parameter B. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we have to have take into another consideration when you're performing stack operations. Unless you're ready to lose the content <clears throat> of where the stack pointer po below where the stack pointer points to, don't change the stack pointer, especially don't make it bigger. Okay? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Incrementing once versus incrementing twice, or to that to the to that effect, to that effect. <laughs> well, you can always use an add instruction instead of you know you can use the add instruction and the LDI followed by add instruction if you have that many things to deal with. All right, so the thing that I want to talk about next is everything below where the stack pointer points to is quote unquote not safe. Okay, you can kind of imagine there is, there's a special kind of gremlins that lives in the processor and it goes like, hey, this is below where the stack pointer points to. I'm just going to go there and randomly make some changes. Okay, but as long as you're at or above where the stack pointer points to, you're protected, you're good, okay? So that little gremlin is called interrupts, okay? But I don't want to get into the discussion of interrupts just yet, okay? But the point is, you don't want to change the stack pointer, especially moving it up, unless you are 100% sure you don't need all the things below where the stack pointer points to. So now the question is, hmm, okay. So how do we get to A, okay? Because you know, the first thing we need to do is to get to parameter A. So I think this can help. So what this is doing is it is just making a copy of register D in register C. So now they both point to the same location. And then go like, yeah, that's a good location to start with, but that's not exactly what I want. I want to get to the next instruction. So right at this point, C becomes, C is now the address of parameter A. Good, the address of parameter A sounds good, but I don't need the address because the C code is not adding the address of A to the address of B, it's adding A to B. So what do I, what do I need to do to get to parameter A instead of the address of parameter A? The reference, okay, so in TTP ASM term, how do I dereference? Which instruction do I use to dereference this time? I need, we need parentheses. There are only two instructions that make use of parentheses. One is store and one is load. Which one do I need? Load, because we are not changing the content. We're just reading from that content, okay? We are reading from that location. So now we do a LDAC. So the register A, this is register A, I'm going to emphasize this is register A, is now the D reference of the address of parameter A. That cancels out, and that's really just A. Okay, have you guys all learned that uh, the reference is the opposite of the address of? Okay, very good. All right, cool. We, we, now we have parameter A stored in Register A, we just have to do the same thing to parameter B. But wait, hold on a second here. Parameter, parameter B is not where register C is pointing to. What do I need to do to register C so the register C also points to register, I mean, parameter B at this point? Yeah, no, just once, because it's already pointing at A, so we have to increment it exactly just once. So C is now the address of parameter B, and I can now use this instruction, oops, so that register B is now the D reference of the address of parameter B, which is really just B itself. Yes? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I said one thing and then typed something else. I'll make a really good spy. Where's, where's the secret base? I'll tell them one thing, and honestly, I'm really trying to tell them the right address, 
but something else is going to come out of my mouth. I'll pass all the lie detectors with flying colors, and they go to that address. It's like, this is a public toilet. <laughs> Just dig a little deeper. It's somewhere around here. All right. So now we have A and B in registers A and B. What do I need to do? How do I get this? Which instruction? Add, okay, that seems to be only one possible choice in this case, right, just simple add. Okay, so I can do add AB or BA, but add AB makes more sense because now the actual sum is also in the register that is supposed to return the value, so I get everything done in one single swoop, okay? So this is basically doing the same thing as return A plus B in the C code. Great, I'm ready to return now. So I just have to go like, okay, let's go to the return address. Uh, I can use register B or register C. Either one works, okay, increment register D, JMPB, done. All right, so, all right, so this looks a little bit funky, okay? So we want to test the add function before we make it even more complicated. So in the C code, okay, we are going to go, uh, we'll delete this function call. Instead, we'll just go like, okay, let's go ahead and add, you know, um, I'll give you some constants, you know, let's say, you know, six and seven, okay? So it should return a 13, okay, in register A. So we'll go ahead and say, okay, save the C code, and now we test run the C code. G plus GCC dash G dash O, this is called add. Add.c is the name of the C code. GDB add. Okay, put a breakpoint on line 21. Run the program, and now we do another IR, which stands for info register, by the way. And we look at the first register. It is hexadecimal D, which is also in decimal 13. Woohoo! Okay, that got the job done. Yep. Yes. Yeah, but I haven't implemented the call to add just yet in the assembly code. So I have to make some more modifications to the assembly code before the assembly code does what the C code is doing. But I do confirm that the C code is returning a value of 13 in its own register A. Now, this is a gigantic register A. It's a 64-bit register A. But the concept is we are still using one of the registers to specify the return value, okay? Because it's one of the most efficient way to do it. Okay, so now we kind of go back to this, to this code here and go to the assembly side and we go like, we are not Johnny, we are not calling Johnny anymore. So this time it's, you know, we are calling sum, okay? So I'm just making minimal changes so I don't have to make massive changes here. All right. This lines 36 to 38 are pushing the return address. So this is why I have to put the new lines before that because I'm supposed to push the arguments before pushing the return address. That's part of the agreement. Okay, so we have to push seven and six on the stack. In which order? What do I push first? Seven, because the convention says I have to push the last argument first. So we have to push the seven first. Okay, so LDI A with seven, decrement D, ST D A. That pushes the seven on the stack. LDI A with six, decrement D again, ST D A again. That pushes the six on the stack. And then we push the return on the, the return address on the stack, which is from line 43 to line 45. And then we perform the actual jump so that we continue execution at the function. And this time, when it comes back, I do have some items to clean up because the, the function will clean up the return address, but the two arguments will still be sitting on the stack. So that's why I need increment D and increment D here in order to deallocate the arguments that would otherwise be still sitting on the stack. So save the code. 
I'm not gonna say I'm gonna say something that will annoy some people to no end, but I'm gonna say it and do it anyway, because that's part of the experience of this class. I'm not gonna write the comments, so it'll be up to you guys to to write the comments. I'm I don't have a problem sharing this code with you, but you're gonna be the one writing the comments. Okay. So why do you think I do it this way? Yes. To, well, actually, I would not even encourage to, you to watch the video. I want you to try to comment it without watching the video first. So that will force you to kind of think about this. You would have, hopefully, a vague recollection of what we talked about today. Okay? And through that vague recollection, you will just kind of jot down something, and then you, can, you, then you can watch the video or watch the trace to confirm whether your comment is correct or not. And get, get, getting through that process is helping you to one understand and two to remember what all of the how all of these pieces are put together. All right, so let's go ahead and test run the assembly code. And let me get out of here first. Get back to this folder, and then we test run the assembly code. I do about the same, you know, programming um, example, you know, every semester, but there's also slight variances from one semester to another semester. All right, so it says everything is good. Simulating, and it's now turning in the trace data. And once we have the trace, we're gonna look through the trace, okay? Because that is actually one of the most important steps of understanding how everything connect in this class. So now we go to the trace here, and we'll start from the beginning, okay? You know, this will be very boring at first. We got a no op, doesn't do a single thing. We initialize the stack corner, which also basically does nothing. We continue execution at main, okay? We continue execution at main. This is uh, putting a seven into register A, confirmed. Uh, register D, which is our stack pointer, is now FF because we it's decremented from zero, zero. Okay, so far so good. And then we store the seven onto the stack. Now this is significant, okay? If I were you, I would use a separate piece of paper, uh, maybe graph paper, so that I can actually track the content on the stack. Okay, so on one hand, you know, on the left-hand side, I would put down the addresses on the stack. On the right-hand side, I would put down the value at those locations on the stack, okay? This is a kind of a dynamic thing. It's harder for me to kind of do it on, in a static way and just give you the picture because it, they change over time. But this means, you know, we have 707 at location FF, and without, you know, going through the boring trace, now we have 06 at the lower location of FE, and then we have the return address at location FD. So these three cells in the spreadsheet, <clears throat> um, C11, C17, and C23, they collectively give you a picture of what is on the stack. We have parameter B, parameter A, and the return address. And the stack pointer, which is register D, is pointing to the last thing that we just push on the stack which is the return address. Are we doing okay so far with that explanation? So this trace really, from my perspective, it really should help connect all the, all the dots because you can actually see it. Nothing is happening in real time because this is all captured and you can comment, okay? If you get a copy of this particular trace, you can use your cell, your column H, for your own comments. So that way you can add as much comment as you want, okay? And say, okay, what is happening here? Why is it happening? Or what, how does it connect to some earlier things that happened? Okay, so let's move on. So now we do a JMPI to sum, which means we are continuing execution at the function. So at that function, so this is where you want to kind of update your picture so that you, know, you have both register D and register C pointing to the return address. Yes? Okay. 
it is the return address in main. It would be the label called sum returns here. Hmm? That's the halt instruction. That's where the halt instruction is. So that's a very good question. And if you are you know, driving this whole thing, you can go to the assemble tab and just go there and make your confirmation. So you can, you can actually go to here. This is our, okay, not the halt instruction, but the uh, instruction right after J, the JMPI instruction. And you can also see how the label definition is right here at location two six. Because you know, that's, our, that's where we need to return to in order to continue execution in the caller. Is that okay? All right. So getting back to the analysis tab, okay. So register C now points to exactly the same place as reg register D because I just made, you know, I just made a copy, copy register. Um, and then I increment C so that C is now pointing to location FE. You already know that location FE is where parameter A is located. So that's what you probably need to write down, okay, over here with the other cells, is where is register C pointing to? Register C is now pointing to parameter A. It is not parameter A, it is the address of parameter A. I go like, okay, that's great, but that's not what I really want. I want the value of parameter A. So once we have a dereference here, Register A is now parameter A, which is six. Is that okay? All right. And then you're know, using a very similar me mechanism by incrementing C again, it is now FF. And we can recall that earlier location FF got a seven, which is our second argument. So now register C has the address of parameter B. And it's not the address of parameter B that I really want. I want the value of parameter B. So I need to dereference it. So now register B becomes the value of parameter B. Once I have parameter A and parameter B, I can perform the add. So after the add instruction, I have the 13 stored in register A at this point. And then we continue execution. Okay, this is fine. Um, and then we continue, and these three instructions, you should probably start to recognize these three as one single chunk of instruction. They're just returning, okay? We're just returning to the caller. So by the time we do a JMPB, it already, register B already has the return address, which is 26 in it. So we continue execution at location 26. But by the time we get to location 26, you can see that register D, the stack pointer, is not, zero zero yet okay it is at fe because we it is still pointing to the six that we pushed on the stack earlier do we have any use of that value of six on the stack at this point now that add is sum is all done no nope, we don't need it do we have any use of the seven that is also sitting on the stack at location ff nope so that's why we have two increment d instructions in order to get rid of the things that we don't need on the stack anymore. After the first increment D, D becomes FF from FE. After the second increment D, it went from FF back to zero, zero, and now the stack is balanced before we get to the halt instruction to conclude the execution of this program. So this is a very simple program from the perspective of C, but this is what's happening behind the scenes in assembly language. All right, so do we have any questions? Yes, go ahead. So you're asking why we push the return address last. 
because in C and C++, there is such, such a thing called a variable number of arguments. So we, we don't know exactly how many arguments are actually on the stack. There are certain cases you can define a function like that, and that's why you need the return address to be at a predictable location, which is right at where the stack pointer points to by, at the time of the entry of the function. Is that okay? All right, so if, if you guys are thinking, I have never heard of you know, being able to have a variable number of arguments or parameters in C, there is such a thing. Um, the prototype is, in, is using dot, 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 okay? So I can give you an example. You know, it would compile, but it's meaningless. But it's just an example right now, so. Okay, so I'm just gonna define it, okay? You can define a function called f, okay? It has a known function, you know, a known uh, parameter. It doesn't matter what it is, okay? We'll just say there's a void pointer p, and then you can use this. Um, we'll go ahead and see if it is syntactically correct, okay? So now we exit the code, gcc-c, which does not give me an executable. All it does is to compile the object code. So we'll do a dot dash c with this source code, and it compiles just fine. Syntactically, it is fine. So how do we call that function? Well, let me show you how we call that function. So we'll say there's a function g, and function g has a local variable char x, okay? And then now we can call f with the address of x, and then we can give it like some additional stuff. Whatever you specify does not matter, okay? Um, you can say x plus two, x plus one, whatever, doesn't matter. This is how you can write code in C++ as well, okay? Because C is a subset of C++, which means everything you, I, did, I do here, you can do it in regular C++. So this is, it looks really funky, right? I mean, how do we get to the other parameters if they have no name? You basically use the, there's a special way to do it, you know, Modern C++ compilers have a very special way to do it, you know, so it's safe. The older compilers you rely on a very, very awkward way of doing this. So in order to get to the one, okay, you know, this one here, the way we do it in this function is we declare a int pointer. I mean, this is really step-by-step, step, so I'm gonna do it step-by-step. Step. So we basically say int pointer is going to be wherever the address of p is plus, um, let's see, uh, plus one, right. That's how we get to the address of the one. And then when you want to retrieve the one, then we dereference this thing here. Obviously we kind of need to cast everything here because otherwise, you know, the, uh, the type is not, it's going to be mismatched. So using this code, using the old compiler standard, on line six, the dereferenced result is going to be the one that I pass over here. So it's a very, very awkward way of doing things. So why do you think C++ or regular C has this particular feature, in quotes? Which function does, yeah, go ahead. Average is, okay, that's one, okay, but you need a way to indicate the end, where do you find the end, right? So which function or which family of functions has this kind of setup? Huh? C, C string functions? Um, yeah, and also standard, you know, input output functions, printf, scanf, sprintf, fscanf, and so on and so forth. They all have a similar kind of setup because all of those functions have what we call a format string, and inside the format string, you can specify what to expect as, quote unquote, the following arguments. 
So, and depending on how the format string is created, you can say, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff after this, or just one or none. So that's, you know, this is one of the things that was a necessity in C. But C++ does not have this necessity because of the use of the less than less than symbol and the greater than greater than symbol with C in and C out. So you can chain all of those operations. What is the return type of the less than less than operator? The, yep, the, the original stream. So less than less than and greater than greater than, they are one of the few operators that are by definition left associative because they have to be. So anyway, so I hope this explains why you know, we push the last argument first because we never really know how many there are. So that was a very good question. You know, kind of led to a slight detour. Yep. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't matter what point it is. You just have to, I mean, typically, you know, in the C fashion, this is usually a const char pointer. So it's a string. So, but it doesn't really matter because, you know, we are just saying, okay, let's get to the next thing. And that's how we get to the next thing, is we look at the address of the first argument and say, just pretend that there's a next thing here. Where do I find that next thing? So the next thing is your p plus 1, or the address of p plus 1. And now I go like, OK, I know what that thing is supposed to be. It's supposed to be an integer pointer. It's supposed to be the address of an integer. Now, do we really know it is supposed to be an integer? Maybe, maybe not. So there's a lot of assumptions here. If you push the wrong thing on the stack, there's no way the compiler can check for you. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> okay, so the question is where, that, where is that const placed? So because the const is before the char, it means I can change the pointer. I just cannot change what it points to. And besides, you know, p plus 1, you know, the address of p plus 1 doesn't change a single thing. I'm just looking at p and go like, hey, where are you? I'm over here. OK, so who is next to you? Or what is the location that is next to you? So that's what address of p plus 1 is returning, is what is the address that is right next to you? Which, using the standard that we just talked about, would be that integer of 1. Is that okay so far? All right. So this is some really kind of funky stuff that has a very, you know, historical you know origin. But that's the reason why we have the caller callee agreement as they are described in this class. That agreement is for the most part the same across all the compilers. So once you understand the agreement, it's like, oh, okay. So most GCC implementations would also make use of the same assumptions and organize the code the same way. Are we good so far? Okay. We got five more minutes. I really want to kind of show you guys how to do some additional stuff with this program. So we'll go ahead and try that. All right. So what if I want to do this? What if I want to take the return value of Johnny John, me, ah. and Ryan, and use the return values as my arguments when I call sum. How do I do this? And I would argue that we know how to do this already. I have already talked about enough concepts to get this done. Yes. It's going to look a little bit uglier and longer, but the concepts are all here. Because when you look at line 20 of the C code, you have to think about the order of things. Okay? Do we call some first? No, because we would not know the arguments to push on the stack yet at that point. So that means I cannot call some. Do I want to call Johnny first? No, because you know, that's our first argument. We are supposed to push this last argument first. So that means the only thing we should do first is to call Ryan. 
after we call Ryan, okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead and call Ryan first. Okay, so let's go ahead and replace these three lines of code with a call to Ryan. So we have the LDI uh, A Ryan returns here. Uh, decrement D, STDA, GMPI to Ryan, oops, and then the label return, Ryan returns here is here. So now we have the return value in register A. What do we do at this point? Push it on the stack, very good, because register A has the return value, but it's not on the stack yet, okay? So now we have to follow the caller callee agreement and push it on the stack. So now we have decrement D, S, T, D, A, because register A has the return value. And what do we do? Kind of the same thing, you know, we now call Johnny, and then we just do a kind of the same thing. Uh, Johnny returns here. Decrement D, S, T, D, A, uh, J, M, P, I to John, me, and then Johnny, J-O-H-N-N-Y, returns here, it's here, and then we push that return value on the stack. That's it. Okay, so this time, when this is all done, register A should contain 12, because Ryan returns a 7, Johnny returns a 5, 7 plus 5, is 12 okay so we'll take a look we still got two more minutes so if this doesn't work i still got time to debug it yes nope because we still only have two arguments on the stack all right so we'll take a look and take uh pop yep pop d and Submit, okay. The last version of this code does not introduce any new concept. It is an application of all the concepts that we have talked about already, just connecting the concepts in a different way. Okay, so that's kind of the essence of this class is right now we are looking at this sort of program. And let's see, it's all done. So we want to confirm that it is returning a 12, okay? That's a confirmation, zero C is a 12, and we balance everything, the stack pointer goes back to zero, zero, and there's a halt instruction at the end. So this is all good. Yes? Huh? Yes. So the sum function call is the JMPI to sum, this is where we continue execution at sum. So it is still using FD for the return address, um, but so when you look at what we push on the stack, we have five pushed where the six used to be, and then the seven is still, um, it, it's a little funky because you, it goes back and forth quite a bit, and this is where you know, looking at the trace is going to be useful because this is not a single thing like the stack goes like this and then go back up again. It goes like this. It bounces like this a little bit. But don't leave just yet because you do have a lab today that relates to the code that I just talked about today. So hopefully you guys will make some connection between the lecture, the sample program, and also what your lab is asking you to do today. So today's lab is called params and return value. I hope that sounds familiar because otherwise we're in big trouble. And the access code is frame. So we'll talk about what the frame is, you know, next, well, to, you know, this Thursday. I'll see all of you over there and Finish up with uh...